So the first example here is uh, a collaborative activity between the Red Cedar uh, Engineering Services Group and SC Aerospace, as Angela mentioned, a new customer of, of, of Red Cedar. And it uh, has to do with optimization of laminate composite structures in the aircraft uh, aerospace industry. So um, I will turn it over to Nate Chase from uh, Red Cedar, who will speak uh, and present on behalf of this team. Nate? Thanks, David. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, as David mentioned, my name is Nate Chase. I'm an engineering analyst here at Red Cedar. I've been here for about five years now. Today I'm going to discuss the topic of optimization of composite aircraft structural components, and specifically a uh, project that we worked on with ST Aerospace um, in the process of getting them to be a heat user. What are the design goals when uh, designing a composite part? Well, similar to uh, with your structural components that are metal, we want to minimize mass and cost. We have constraints on material failure. With composites, the most popular material failure modes are Siwoo failure criterion, Sai Hill failure criterion, and a max strain failure criterion, for example. We also typically constrain buckling and stiffness of our parts, and we sometimes look at other performance targets such as acceleration that we constrain during an optimization run. In addition, we'd like to take into account the manufacturability of the parts that we create. We want to make sure that the layups we design are symmetric and balanced, typically, and we want to consider and account for during the design process the fly drops and overlaps that are going to be uh, implemented during the manufacturing process. Um, during an optimization, our typical design variables with composite structures are number of plies, ply material and orientation of individual plies, and also the ply boundary shapes that are used in designing the structure. So to design composite parts with optimization, um, if the number of plies is fixed, it's pretty straightforward. We have a nice interface with our HEADS master and portal, which will directly modify the orientation and the material choice for the given ply. And we can account for the manufacturability when we design these, these types of uh, composites where the plies are fixed by using a symmetry card, which will ensure that our final part is symmetric and we can design for the balancing of the composite in the, by defining depend, dependencies between our design variables. However, if the number of plies varies, then we need a script or some sort of a program to redefine the laminate scheme for each new design. During the process of this SD Aero project that I'll discuss in a few minutes, we've developed a generalized method for handling the situation of varying number of plies that is a direct interface to NASTRAN, but it could also be extended to Abacus or whatever other uh, FEA tool you use in designing composites. Um, one thing to keep in mind when you do have a varying number of plies is that this scenario makes the optimization search more complicated. So when you define your problem up front, you need to account for this in your design, your allowable design time, as well as the complexity of the design variables that you're choosing. So in a more general sense, laminates may be composed of several sublaminate regions which overlap to form a lamination scheme at a given point, which I'll discuss through a given example here. So in a composite structure, a lamination scheme at any point may be constructed of multiple overlapping sublaminates. So if we look at this example, we have three laminates which make up our part. Laminate one on the far left, laminate two in the center, and laminate three on the far right. Each laminate is made up of sublaminates, which contain a given set of plies and with those orientations and material choices. So for this example, laminate one is made up of a single sublaminate, which we've called here a base skin sublaminate. Um, this is the tannish colored region extending across the whole part on the top. Um, you can see that it also extends to laminate two and laminate three. Those laminates also have additional sublaminates, which we call the local reinforcement one, which is the blue sublaminate, and local reinforcement two, which is the yellow sublaminate. So you can see that although we have a single part, there's overlapping sublaminate regions which make up separate uh, laminates in the part. Since they do overlap, we need some sort of a way to update all the laminate properties for each change that's given made to a given sublaminate. So during optimization, what we're actually designing are the sublaminates. 
Um, and then laminate schemes are used to define how the part is assembled. And this is where we develop a program to assemble the definitions in uh, mastery format based on the sublaminate designs that are coming out of heads. So we look at this little figure. You have your sublaminate de definitions, which are essentially your design variables, where you have the number of plies, the orientation, and the material type, which also can have varying thickness. Those get input into the lamination scheme, which is defined before optimization and read into the script. And what the lamination scheme does is it assembles the newly constructed definition for the sublaminates into your laminates and outputs the PCOMP card, which would get read into the NAS stream. So when we loop this into our HEADS process, HEADS, or specifically Sherpa, modifies the design variable values, which again correspond with at the sublaminate level. These get input into the script that was created such that the laminates are updated based on the assembly you've told the script will be constant throughout the run. This updates all the properties for all of the laminates and outputs them to appropriate PCOMP cards, which are read into NASTRAN. NASTRAN is then run. We get our responses, which could be your SIWU failure criterion buckling and displacement, for example. He then reads in the response values and makes a decision for what the next design should be, and this process is repeated as we normally have during an optimization run. So if we go back to our example, this lamination scheme that we discussed to begin with would be defined prior to the optimization such that it can be read into the read into our program that does the assembly process. Specifically, this is done by de defining IDs for the sublaminates. In this case, <laughs> our base skin section has been given ID 20001 and then 20002, 20003 for our other sublaminates. Our program reads in this data and assembles the laminates by means of, for example, laminate 3 would be defined as TCOM 33 equals 20001 plus 20002 plus 20003. So every time a change is made to any of those sublaminates, that change gets propagated through to the laminate level. And again, we need some sort of this automated process so that we don't have to change the same sublaminate in hundreds of different laminates, which it may be overlapping into. So if we look at an application that we worked with for STRO, first STRO did a manual design process. During this process, they fix the outer shape based upon aerodynamic design criteria. They then evaluated their given structural load cases in NASTRAN, as an example, their flight and landing load cases. And they did a manual design process to try to get the best design they could based on those NASTRAN load cases. And then they defined lamination schemes based upon intuition and experience that would be used for the optimization. His MDO was then used to iterate further on the best design that the manual process could find, where we included the following design variables, the number of plies, which means that we have to use the automated program that we discussed previously. We are also varying in the ply material, where it could be a fabric or unidirectional for a given ply, and varying also the ply orientation for a given ply. So the first component out of three components we optimized was a tail, where the objective of the optimization was to minimize the mass with constraints on the Siwoo failure index and buckling factors. And for the tail, we were varying the number of plies in the sublaminates and the orientation of the ply. So we had 12 design variables total. The manual design that uh, ST Arrow provided to us was infeasible in terms of the buckling constraints. The design he found not only satisfied those buckling constraints, but also found a 3% reduction in mass. The second component optimized was that of the wing. Again, the objective was to minimize mass with constraints on sidewood failure index and buckling factors. Again, we were varying the orientation and the number of plies. But for the wing, we also allowed for a material choice where a given ply could be either unidirectional or fabric. So for the wing, we had more than 80 design variables. Again, the baseline design was infeasible in terms of the buckling constraints. And Heeds was able to find a 12% reduction in mass while satisfying all the 
constraints imposed on the wing. Final optimization performed was on the fuselage. Again, we were trying to minimize mass with the same constraints. Um, this time we were varying the number of plies in the orientation and had the material choice fixed at a fabric. So in total we had greater than 120 design variables for this fuselage. And I should mention this had also had 20 different load cases. So for the fuselage we were able to find a 9% reduction in mass and just to give a little bit of an example of how complicated the design space was for this, 35% of the evaluated designs were infeasible. And this figure here is a plot we have available within the new HEATS post. We call it a constraint violations plot. What it does is it shows for each constraint that you specified the number of design evaluations that uh, violated the constraint. So this was a good indication to let us see what, what, uh, what constraints were driving the search during the optimization. So to summarize, working with ST Arrow, we were able to find significant mass savings over a manual design process. And to do this, we had to institute a, a new um, methodology using a new program that we developed that ensured that the laminates were assembled properly based on a sub-laminate definition.